All right. John chapter number 13. Let's dig in here in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, and we'll, I'll keep reading here to verse 3. It says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. Now, as Jesus grew in his life, Jesus, of course, was God in the flesh, right? And, and as he grew in his life, you know, I think more things became to become known to him of who he was, and just gaining more knowledge and more wisdom. God obviously has all wisdom, all knowledge, all knowing. God knows the beginning from the end. God is everlasting. God knows everything. But when God took on the form of a man, when God became a human being, he also took on certain limitations of being a man. Jesus Christ was completely a man and God at the same time. And again, it's real difficult to kind of grasp that. But you know, from the, from the moment he was a child. He didn't have all this knowledge and wisdom. He learned, you know, he didn't, he didn't come out of the womb speaking and walking and everything else. He was an infant. He was a child. He grew. And the Bible talks about how he grew in the Lord. Even when he was, when he was a younger child and he was in the synagogue and he was talking to the doctors and the lawyers and they were amazed at how well he understood but he was still like talking with them and questioning them and, and still learning and growing. And we see at this point now in Jesus' life, he's kind of, he's come to a lot of knowledge. I mean, this is at the end of his ministry. And that's why it says there in verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He's gotten to the point now, he is fully confident, fully aware, and fully knowing exactly what he's doing, that the time has come, and that, and that he, and he's known he's from God for a while, because obviously he's been saying that, that God has sent him, and he speaks those things which he heard of the Father, and that he's the Son. But he kind of reaches this point now, it doesn't say he knew this only just at this time, but, but he's gained this kind of full comprehension, full understanding of everything that he needed to do by this point. And um, the hand of God was upon him. But I just want to point that out because, you know, he didn't know that from way early on. It's something that he had to grow to as being a man um, while being God in the flesh. But this, what he does here is really interesting because think about who Jesus Christ is just for a second when we get into the story. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, right? As we were just saying, a perfect man, a, you know, the Son of God came to seek and to save that which is lost and came to die for the sins of the whole world. Look at what he does. It says that um, in verse 4, he says, He riseth from supper. He, he just had dinner with his friends, with his disciples. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So he, he kind of takes off the clothes he was wearing and he puts on this towel. And he goes about the table and it says, After that he poureth water into a basin. So he gets a bowl of water and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. So he's going around this table, the dinner table. This is Jesus Christ and they know he's the Christ and he knows he's the Christ. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's, you know, he is a righteous king. He is someone of, of very high exaltation. Right? Someone that you look to and respect. He's the master. He's the teacher. He's the rabbi. He's the one that you're looking to. And he just puts on, he puts a towel around himself. And you can imagine him just getting down. You know, they're sitting down, getting down on his hands and knees and taking this bowl of water and just wiping their feet and just, just scrubbing their feet. I mean, I don't know about your all feet, but I think of, of how my feet smell. I mean, you're walking around all day and, you know, you walk, they get dirty and dusty. And if you're not wearing, you know, if you're wearing open-toed shoes and things like that, you know, and he's getting down and washing, and washing their feet. This is the Son of God getting down on his knees and washing his disciples' feet. 
This is a huge event in the Bible, and we're going to spend a little, quite a bit of time on this um, in the sermon just because this is something that we really need to, to focus on, and we're going to get into um, some more Bible verses and stuff. But um, we're gonna, let's just read through this, this section now of him doing this clean, cleansing of the disciples' feet because this is a big event. This is a major event for the Son of God to humble himself and to not only wash their feet, but then he put on the towel. So it's like his own clothing he's drying them with. And he's wearing that as he goes from disciple to disciple. Just that, the, the, from cleaning their feet, wearing that towel on himself. Very, very humbling. A very, very lowly task to do for somebody. Is to go and actually wash their feet. I mean, think about this, right? Um, Maybe they don't, they're not really around that much anymore, but I've seen them sometimes still in the airport where you'll have the shoe shiner, right? You don't think of somebody who shines shoes as being, man, that's what I want to be. You know, like I want to get to that level of being a shoe shiner. It's not looked on as a job of having a lot of respect and a lot of, you know, of something that you, that, that's your goal to attain to. It's typically a humble job that people take because they need to work. They need to make some money, so what can they do? They're going to they're gonna clean up your shoes for you. And typically, you're just kind of you know, working for tips or working for a low wage, cleaning up people's dirty shoes. This is something similar to what Jesus did. I mean, it's a, the best analogy we can have today because we don't really have this custom of, of you know, washing people's feet that much anymore. But um, what he did here, it's, it's, we need to just let that sink in of, of what a mighty, powerful man Jesus was to, to get down and to do that because he is making a very, a very significant point in doing that. So it says, you know, at the end of verse 6, it says that he, was, he wiped them off with the towel he was girded with. Ver, or verse 5, verse 6 now says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? So Peter, I mean, he sees what's going on. He's like, wait, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Saying, so you don't really know what I'm doing right now. You'll, you'll get it in a little, a little bit later. But right now you don't understand why I'm doing this. Verse 8, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. So, you know, I mean, Peter's intentions are good. Right? His heart's in the right place. He's saying, look, you're the king of kings. You're the Christ. You're not going to wash my feet. You know, that's, that's too low of a job for you, Jesus, to do to me. Now, even though his heart may be in the right place, and we saw this, I preached an entire sermon on, on Simon Peter. He had a great heart, and he was a great man of God, but he had a tendency to speak sometimes when he ought not to. He, he ought to just, you know, let Jesus do his thing because you don't want to find yourself rebuking Jesus Christ or telling him that, you know, that he's not going to do something or he shouldn't be doing something. Peter had a tendency to do this. Um, you remember, not, not only here, but um, when Jesus was saying that he was going to be crucified, and Jesus said, not so, Lord. Like, no, you're not going to go die. Jesus turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And again, Peter's intentions were great. You know, he, was, he loved Jesus, but he had a tendency to say things that just, they weren't true, and he shouldn't really have been saying those things to Jesus, telling him that. And this is another one of those examples where he's saying, look, you're not going to wash my feet because he saw what was going on. But when Jesus is doing something, you, you let him do it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't tell him that what he's doing is wrong and he shouldn't be doing that. Um, especially after he said, look, you don't know what I'm doing right now. You know, it's okay to question, like, wait, what are you doing, Jesus. But Jesus said, okay, you don't know what I'm doing right now, but you're going to know. And then to follow up with that and say, look, you're never going to wash my feet. Look at Jesus' response. He says, Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. This is serious. He's saying, look, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. Verse 9, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith, un saith to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but it's clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. So then Peter goes to the other extreme. He's like, okay, well, if you're saying I'm a part with you, and this proves obviously his heart was in the right place. He's like, wash my whole body then. You know, like, like if you're saying I have no part with you, if you don't wash my feet, then wash, wash me all over. And Jesus is saying, no, we don't need to do that. Your feet is good enough. Now, obviously, this is one of the symbolic points of what he's doing, of just being clean or being washed, going to Jesus to be cleansed. And he says, once you're clean, you're clean. If you don't want to be cleansed by Jesus, 
then you have no part in Him whatsoever. We need for salvation to be cleansed of our sins. Right? When we sin, when we commit sin, we are dirty. We have dirtied our soul. We have dirtied our spirit. Our spirit is actually dead. We need to go to Jesus and put our faith and trust on Him in order to be cleansed from those sins, in order to be white as snow. You know, even though our sins are, have, have blotted us and making us dirty, you know, when, when Jesus Christ cleanses us, when He cleans us, when He washes us, we are white as snow. We are without spot. We have nothing wrong with us, you know, from, from that viewpoint of our sin. And that He completely forgives us of all of, the, of all our sins. So if you don't go to Jesus be washed by Him, you have no part with Him. You can't say, well, I don't want you to wash me. I want to wash myself, but I still want to have dinner with you. He says, you have no part with me unless you, let me, unless you, you know, rely on me to wash you. You can't clean yourself. You can't clean up your life and, and, and think that that's good enough. You have no part with me if you don't allow me to do this. That's what he's telling to Peter. But um, that was, that's one application of this, and that's one of the meanings of this. But um, I want to keep reading here. It says in verse 11, it says, because when he said they're clean, he says, you're clean, but not all of you are clean. Verse 11 says, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you're not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, Excuse me, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? So he gets finished, he puts his clothes back on, he takes that towel off, and he says, Do you know what I've just done unto you? Verse 13, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So he's explaining to him, look, I've just given you an example. And the best leaders, the best, the best people who want people to follow them, the best leaders are going to lead by example. They're not just going to tell you to do something. You know, Jesus Christ didn't just tell his disciples to go out and do this and go out and do this. And he just sat back and had everybody waiting on him and serving him. Although he could have done that. And he would have been right to do that because he's the son of God. And he's the one that we have to follow. But you know what he did? He led by example. He says, I'm going to go out and get my hands dirty too. When they went out and they all, his disciples all went out two and two and, and preached the, the gospel of the kingdom. Guess what Jesus did? He also preached he was out doing the same exact work that his disciples were doing. He was out daily among the people talking and talking and healing and doing all the things that he had to do and doing all that work. He didn't just sit back. He led by example. And he, he lived the perfect example because Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was without sin. Everything that Jesus Christ did, he says, I do always those things which please the Father. Everything that Jesus Christ did, he's always pleasing to God. And that's the example that we need to look to Jesus for. Now, I want to point out this phrase here because he says in verse 13, ye call me, he says, You're, you call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. Jesus Christ right here is claiming to be their master and to be their Lord. Now, flip if you would keep your finger in John 13. Flip over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, just a few books back in the Bible, Matthew 23. Because again, if you ever want to prove the deity of Jesus Christ, you can turn to just about any chapter in the book of John to do so. And this one is no exception. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and it's important that we have the right Jesus. We were just talking to some Mormons today, and you know they like to do this. They like to try to tell you, well, look, you're here because you're trying to tell us that we need to believe on Jesus to be saved and we believe on Jesus, so there's no problem. And I hear this all the time from them is that they say, well, look, we're good anyways because we believe in Jesus. They've got the wrong Jesus. And that's a huge problem. If someone else is named Jesus other than the Jesus Christ of the Bible and you put your faith on that other person that you're believing, whether you've made them up in your head or someone else has written about them or whatever the case may be, that is not the right Jesus that's going to save you. 
We need to put our faith on Jesus Christ of the Bible, the Word, the Word that was made flesh, the Word of God. That's what we need to believe to be saved. And, um, you know, the, the, the latter-day Satan, they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. They don't believe that He was the Son of God, that, of, you know, the, that God came, became a man and dwelt among us. They believe that he was a God or just the Son of God. They believe all kinds of different things. But it's important that we understand who Jesus was. Jesus is the I am he of the Bible. He's God in the flesh. If you're in Matthew 23, look what he says here. He says in verse 8, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven neither be ye called masters for one is your master even Christ but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted now Jesus is teaching them right here in Matthew 23 8 he's telling his disciples he's telling he's telling all the people look you don't need to be don't be calling yourselves rabbi don't be calling yourself father and don't be calling yourself master. Now, there are people and there are religions that do this very thing today and it blows my mind that this still exists. I mean, it doesn't blow my mind for the, for the Jews because they don't believe in Christ. So they're not going to believe his words anyways. For, so for the Jews to call themselves rabbi, it's blasphemous. Jesus said not to do it because there's only one master and it's Christ. But they don't believe Christ. They don't believe his teaching. So I could understand why they still use that term. But what about Father? One of the biggest, if you want to call it Christian religions in the world today, is the Catholic religion, Catholicism. And, and there's, there's tons of members of the Catholic Church. And what do they call their priests? They call them Father. Yeah. And what did Jesus say? He says, Call no man your Father upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven. He specifically says, and look, again, without soul winning today, we're talking to someone saying, oh, you interpret that different. You know, this girl, it's, it's the Mormon people, right? As the, the, the Mormon girl saying, uh, you know, well, that's how you interpret it. Like, no. Well, it was the verse where I said, um, Jesus said, there, you know, there's, there's none good but one, and that's God. And she said, well, that's your interpretation. I said, no, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> that's not open for interpretation. It's just what the book says. That's what Jesus Christ says. And she didn't believe that because she doesn't believe Jesus. She doesn't believe the Bible. But um, it's just like this statement. You can't interpret this. I mean, Jesus Christ is just saying, look, don't be called rabbi, don't be called father, and don't be called master. And these are all terms given to a spiritual leader, right? Someone who's, who's leading a, a congregation of people and trying to lead them into things of God. Rabbi, master, and father. Yet, you still have the Catholic Church saying, call me father. Completely contrary to what the Bible is teaching. And it just blows me away. I mean, there's just no respect whatsoever for what the Bible says. And they'll try to explain it away, but it's very clear. I mean, you, you, again, it, you, I don't see how you could come up with another meaning to these simple statements and these simple words. But Jesus Christ said, he tells everyone else, he said, you know, don't call anyone your master or rabbi or father. But back in John 13, he says, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. He's saying, I am. I am the master. I am the Lord. He's saying, you're saying right when you call me that. And that's why he's saying, don't call anyone else that, because that title belongs unto him and him alone. And that's Jesus Christ, the master, the rabbi, the Lord, the, you know, the son of the father, but um, you know he get he deserves those titles, and we shouldn't be using those today after he's already said that um, that you shouldn't be using them. Now he points that out to say, as his mas as their master and lord, you can flip back to John thirteen if you haven't already. Verse fourteen said, "If I then your lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet." For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And then he explains, he says, look, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Jesus' entire life was an example for us to follow. He did so many things for us to follow. If he would have just sat back and let everyone else wait on him, then you could say, oh, I'm, just, I'm being Christ-like by letting everyone else wait on me. Right? But Jesus said, no, 
if you're going to be Christ-like, if you're going to follow me and do what I do, here's what you need to do. And he humbled himself to the point of getting on his hands and knees and washing feet. That's a humbling job. And he explains, look, the servant is not greater than his Lord. So like, you're not better than, you know, for example, in a, in a work situation. You, know, you have the employee and the boss. The employee is not better than the boss. Right? If the boss tells you to do something, you're not better than the boss. The boss is the one who's paying you. The boss is what, you know, who's 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 has authority over you and that structure. So the the in any situation where you have that, that rule of authority, you're not better than the person above you. Right? So Jesus is saying that. He says, I'm the Lord and Master, so if I'm doing these things, don't think that like, oh, that job is too low for me. Which is why he's doing it. He's saying, don't, don't be thinking like, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm better than that. Oh, really? Are you better than the Lord Jesus Christ? That's, what, that's the point he's trying to make here. He's saying, you're not better than me. And if you're not better than me and I'm getting on my hands and knees and washing feet, then you ought to be able to do the same exact thing. And that's the type of love and the humility we ought to have so that we don't have this walk around with this proud attitude. We are not supposed, it's not all about us. Our life is not all about us. It's actually the opposite. It's about everybody else. We ought to esteem others better than ourselves. This is one of the core doctrines and, and core truths of the Bible. This is extremely important. If you take nothing else away from the sermon tonight, take this away of the fact of the importance of how much Jesus ministered unto other people and his life revolved around helping other people out, helping them out with their problems, sicknesses, diseases, whatever it is, salvation, everything. His life, his work was about everybody else. And the goal and the, the final accomplishments of entire life was giving himself up as a sacrifice for everybody, for the whole world, to pay for our sins, that we don't even deserve it at all. As sinners, we don't deserve that kind of love. We deserve a punishment. But because you know, Jesus set forth that example. So remember that in your life, when people wrong you, when people do you wrong, People done a lot worse to Jesus, but look at the humility he had and still went through with offering himself up as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. That is the type of, you know, we need to be able to humble ourselves. Sometimes, look, pride's going to hold you back from maybe helping someone else that, that gave you a hard time before. Someone who, someone who, you know, ridicules you or mocks you or has done you wrong in the past. And then all of a sudden, you have an opportunity to do, to do something good for them. Pride's going to tell you, I'm not, I don't have anything to do with that person. You remember what they did to me and you hold that grudge? And you think back, are you better than Jesus? Because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And they've all done him wrong. We need to remember that and be able to get past ourselves and not think of ourselves as anything better than Christ. Because he was able to get down on his knees and do that. And he's doing all the work. And don't think that like, oh, well, I, I don't want to go out soul winning because uh, you know, I, can't, I can't talk to people. Well, that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave us the example. I can't do this. I can't do that. Whatever it may be. There's so many examples. This is applicable in so many aspects of our life. Being able to have this humility and, and, this, and this state of mind is what it really is. It, it's, it's the way that you live. It's an attitude that you ought to have of being able to think, to, to, to live your life thinking, what can I do to help other people out? Instead of just thinking, how am I going to better myself? Instead of just thinking, how am I going to make more money? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this for myself? How am I going to get these things? How am I going to accumulate this for myself? When you start thinking in terms of, hey, what can I do for this person? What can I do for that person? What can I do for them? It'll force you to, to be doing a lot more of the things that, that would be considered Christ-like when you have that type of attitude, when you have, when you have that type of goal. Jesus Christ um, came, look, turn, are you in, flip back to Matthew 20. I know I do go back to John 13, but go, go back to Matthew 20 because I want to show you this. In John 13, 17, where we just read, 
he, he tells them, he explains all this stuff and he says, you know, the servant's not greater than his Lord. I've given you this example that you can do likewise. The things that I've done to you, you should do um, likewise. And then he says in verse 17, he says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So you want to be happy in your life? Take this advice that Jesus gave right here. He says, you'll be happy. That's a promise of Jesus. If you, do the, if you know these things, you're going to be happy if you do them. If you know that Jesus Christ is your servant, your servant's not greater than the Lord, and he lives this, this humble life and does these jobs and is, and is willing to serve and do things for other people, that'll make you happy. And it's the opposite of what the world's going to teach you. The world's going to teach you, no, if you want to be happy, you know, it's a cutthroat world. You got to do things to make yourself advance. If you want to be happy, you know, you got to do all these things. And, and who cares if you, you know, if these other people get screwed out of a deal, you just need to do what's right for yourself. Yeah. That's what the world's going to teach you. That's what the world's going to tell you. That's how you're going to be happy. But that's not what the Bible says. Jesus says, happy are you if you do these things where you're serving other people. You're in Matthew chapter 20. Look down at verse number 20. Because Again, along the same lines of being happy, we have James and John were Zebedee's children. And they basically, um, it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. So the mother of James and John, the disciples, with her sons, uh, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. So they go to Jesus this mother and her two sons, James and John, and she says, look, I want my sons to sit on your right hand and, your, and on your left in your kingdom. That's a big favor she's asking. She says, I want my sons to be right there, your right hand men, right and left hand men in your kingdom. I want them to be right up there next to you. And um, Jesus can explain how they could even do this. So he says uh, in verse 22, he says, but Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So he's saying, Well, look, I can't promise you to those positions, because that's not even mine to give. My Father's going to give those positions out. Verse 24, though, it says, and when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So the other ten disciples hear about this and they're like, wait a minute, what do you think you're doing going and asking for those two seats? Like, what about us? And they had indignation against and they're angry about this. Verse 25, but Jesus called them unto him. So he he's going to explain all this and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So he explains this. He says, look, you know, the rulers of this world, the princes of the Gentiles, the princes of the one, you know, the principal people, the men in charge of the Gentiles, you know, they have a dominion. They exercise authority on the people below them. And, and that's, you know, they, um, that's the way they do their power structure. It's not going to be the same way among you, though. He says, the greatest person, so the greatest follower of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be exalted and, 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 you know, being over all these people. He says, if you want to be the greatest... You don't need to have these people coming and serving you. You ought to be going and serving them. That's the way it's going to work in, in the way that Jesus looks at things. So you're not going to be considered great. So the rulers of this earth are considered great because they have all these people working for them, right? I mean, you think of like Obama or whatever, all these people in these real high positions. They've got all these employees and all these people working for them. And if they want food or whatever, they could just send someone to go get it. They've got all these servants, right? that are working for them. And you would look at that person and say, oh man, that's a really great person. He's, he's really established. He's really high up there. But Jesus said, look, if you want to be that, in that type of position in his eyes, in God's eyes, you're not going to be having all these people waiting on you. That's not going to determine that. He says, um, 
Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Minister is, is you're ministering unto somebody. You're doing something for them. That's what the word minister means. So oftentimes, you know, a pastor could be called a minister because he's, he's working and doing things for others. He's ministering unto others. Um, but that shouldn't just be for the pastor. That should be everybody. All of us in the church should be ministers unto others. Um, he says, and whosoever is going to be chief among you, let him be your servant. And he says, even as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ came into this world not so that people could serve him and do things for him and everything else. He came to help other people out. And that's the example that we need to be following today. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4, near the end of the New Testament, near the end of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 4. It's right after the book of James. You have 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one toward another without grudging. So again, we're seeing the same thing, having this charity, doing things for other people, hospitality one toward another without grudging. Don't be upset. Oh man, we've got company and now I've got to feed them. You know, I don't have any money, you know, whatever. Like, look, don't be grudging. You, someone comes in your house, you can receive them in and, and, and be nice to them, be hospitable, offer them things. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's, that's having the right spirit and, and, and being the right way that God's telling us to do. Use hospi hospitality one toward another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. So if God's given you any special gifts or any abilities you know, to serve him, do it, you know, in, in all things that, that the glory and honor could come to Jesus Christ because he was the example and God's the one who gives you these things. So by, by doing that and ministering unto other people, by whatever ability you have to minister, that's going to bring honor and glory unto Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And I, I kept reading here just to mention that because that ties in with the fact that Jesus Christ said, look, you're not, no servant is above his Lord or above his master. And Jesus has said, you know, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more than his servant? So like, you know, we're here serving Christ. Jesus Christ was called just about every name in the book. Okay. He was ridiculed and despised and afflicted and, and harmed and beaten and all, had all these things happen to him. So basically, we shouldn't be surprised if these things were to happen to us because of our faith, because of what we believe. Now, Thank God we live in an environment, in a, in, a, in a nation that's not very hostile towards Christians because it's been founded for the most part on Christianity and in Christian beliefs. But I'll tell you what, those values are getting flushed down the toilet daily. And this nation is very rapidly becoming no longer a Christian nation. And it's not going to be much of a surprise, to me at least, if we start experiencing a lot more persecution for our beliefs because of just the mentality of our culture and of the wickedness that's going on. People grow more and more intolerant of Christians daily. These same people that want to claim and promote, oh, we're, we're tolerant. We tolerate everybody. We tolerate everything. And all they mean by that is they tolerate wickedness. They tolerate sinful you know, perversion. That's what they want to tolerate. They want to tolerate everything that's against God. And the one thing they don't tolerate is, is God and the Bible. They have no tolerance for that. They'll call you hateful because 
You call sodomy a, a wicked abomination that deserves a death penalty. That's, that's hateful. No, that's truth. That's the Bible. That's wholesome. That's good. But they have no, you know, they have no tolerance for the Bible, for Christianity, yet they claim tolerance, and it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. But, um, you know, we shouldn't think that we're better than Christ. So if, if trials and persecutions ever come your way, don't think, oh man, I'm serving Christ. Why is all this stuff happening to me? This shouldn't be happening to me because I'm doing what's right. Actually, it's the exact opposite. If that were the case, then you'd be saying, well, I'm better than Jesus. Because Jesus did everything right and served God 100% perfectly, yet the persecution came on him. So don't ever have this attitude of thinking that, oh, just because bad things might be happening to you, you're experiencing hard times and hard troubles, that has anything to do with you, um, you know, that you shouldn't deserve those things or whatever because you're doing that which is right in God's eyes. Jesus did everything right, yet it came upon him, and we're not better than Jesus. So if they come on us, there's a reason for it. Okay, we don't always know what the reasons are, but we ought to just continue to live solidly to bring honor and glory unto the name of Christ. And we know that these things are going to happen, so we shouldn't be shocked by it. And don't let it get you off guard. Let's go back to John chapter 13. We've got some more points to cover, but that one is, that one is extremely important that we have this mentality of humility and, and putting others... Just looking at other people as being important. And not just important, but look at them and think, what can I do for that person? Even if it comes at a sacrifice of yourself. What can I do for other people? How can I help them get better? This is a Christian attitude. This is something that we ought to strive to get better at, of, of just being able to focus on people. One of the best things you can do for a person is give them the gospel and try to get their soul saved. That's one of the most loving things you can do for a person. But whatever your ability, whatever, whatever you can do, we ought to be able to do those things and look on other people with that type of an attitude. Let's keep reading. Let's jump down to verse number... Um, ...20, because I got, I got a couple more major points to make on this chapter, and we're running... A, a, I'm doing okay on time, but we got a little, bit, um, a little bit more to go here. So, okay, verse 18. Let's keep reading here. He says... I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. So he drops this bomb on him now, and um, it troubles him. You know, it, it's, it bothers Jesus that that one of his twelve disciples, who have been with him for three years, is going to betray him, and turn him in, and turn his back on him, be a traitor. And that is troubling. I mean, even though he knows this needs to happen, he knows who it is, he knows everything. It still bothers him. I mean, no one likes to think about it. This is someone who's his friend. And, and when he confronts Judas in the garden, when Judas confronts him, he says to him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? He's like, Why are you come? And he addresses him as a friend. Judas was Jesus' friend, and his friend betrays him. And it's, that's not a fun thing. If you've ever had a friend betray you, it's not a pleasant thing to experience. And it, and it troubled Jesus, but he tells him. He drops his Bible. He says, Look, one of you shall betray me. Look at verse number 22. Then the disciples looked one another, doubting of whom he spake. And I brought this up in times past. Judas was a devil from the beginning, but nobody knew that. All of his disciples, they spent a lot of time around him. He was wicked in his heart. He was a thief. We saw that last week, um, that he, he had the bag and he was a thief. He was a wicked man, but nobody knew this. It was on the inside. The outward man, he looked fine. He looked like a good guy, but on the inside, he was evil. And nobody knew. His disciples, they looked one another, they're looking around, and just thinking, who is it? And um, it says, doubting of whom he spake. Like, who could it be? Like, it couldn't be, you know, it couldn't be Peter. It couldn't be James. I mean, no way. It couldn't be John. You know, it couldn't be, it couldn't be any of these people. They're looking at everyone, and they're, they're looking at Judas, and it couldn't be Judas. 
That's how it's important. It's so important to understand that though because these people are so deceitful. And you don't always know who the bad guy is. Now, I'm not saying you should be looking around and be like, okay, are you the bad guy? Are you the bad guy? No. But we need to understand that when you're going to give somebody a certain level of trust that you need to have the understanding that you might not really know that person that well. And I bring that up especially with people who have children because you might get to know somebody at church and think they're a great guy, a great girl, you know, they would never do anything, they're a good person, and you leave your child with them, and then something evil happens because they're a wicked person that infiltrated and had this big show of being a good person, but in their heart they were wicked. And it happens. You know what I'm saying is the truth because you read about it in the newspapers. You read about these kids getting defiled, and oftentimes it's with a relative or with, um, you know, someone at church or a teacher or whatever. And on the outside, they look great. And oftentimes, these people don't even get in trouble because, you know, for one, they mess with the kid's mind and try to tell them all these lies and, and tell them things that they'll do if they tell anyone. But even besides that, even sometimes when kids come forward, they'll think there's no way that person did that. There's no way. And they just kind of get brushed aside. And, um, but they're out there. And Jesus' disciples didn't know that Judas was the traitor at all. That no, they didn't even have like a little bit like, wait a minute, Judas did this and this and this and trying to put things together in their heads. Nothing. They had none of that. It says that they were doubting of whom he spake. Um, and what's even more baffling here is we see that they asked Jesus who it is. Look at verse number 23. It says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know that this is John. And uh, verse 24 says, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So you get, get the picture. Jesus, John is sitting right next to Jesus Christ, so close that he's got his head like on his chest. I mean, he's, he's that close to him. So he said, you know, he asks him, he's like, Lord, who is it? And then um, verse 25 says, He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So he's, he's saying, Okay, whoever I give the sop to, that's who it is. Dip the sop, gives it to Judas. And then um, and says, And after that, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now look at verse 28. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. It says no man at the table knew why he did that, or why he spake that unto Judas. So even like, he just said that the person I give this up to, that's who it is, and they still didn't get it. They were just like blinded to this fact that Judas was the, was the traitor. Which I find that that's pretty amazing there. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 30, it says, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Verse 31, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Um, keep reading verse 33. No, I'm getting right with my notes here. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now say I to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Again, just reinforcing what we were just talking about, about ministering unto other people, and basically loving other people, doing things for other people, loving them. That's how all men will know. That's how other people are going to see, hey, this is a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is a Christian. This is someone who's following Christ because they should be able to see that you love other people and that you do things for them. And this is something that we ought to have in our lives. But um, let's keep reading here. I want to see, okay, because I'm a... Um, yeah, we're almost done with the chapter, but there's one more major point I want to make here. Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? 
I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So Peter makes a pretty bold statement. He's saying, look, I'll die for you, Jesus. You know, why can't I go where you're going? I'll follow you so much. I'll follow you unto death. I don't care if they kill me. That's what I'm going to do. And Jesus is like, oh, really? Are you going to do that? Because actually what you're going to do is that he says, the cock shall not crow until thou hast denied me thrice. Yeah, three times you're going to deny me. You're standing here telling me that you're going to die for me, but you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And what I, want to, what I want to do is dig into this a little bit because you may or may not have noticed this before, but it might cause you some form of confusion. And I want to clear this up so that you're not confused about this passage. Now, you know there's four Gospels in the New Testament. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And they all are basically the same story. It's talking about the life of Jesus Christ with his disciples. And, you know, there's some things found in, in Matthew that aren't in Mark or in Luke that aren't in Matthew. You know, we get these different pieces of information, but they all go together. They're all telling the truth and they're all talking about, you know, some of them are talking about the same stories. And um, it's important that you know, I don't want your faith to be shaken in this because someone might come to you one day and be like, well, wait a minute. You know, right here, Jesus said, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice, three times. But in the book of Mark, he says, um, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. So he's saying, which, you know, so people might say, well, which is it? Did he say, before the cock crows? Or before the cock crows two times, you're going to deny me three times. Okay? And, and this is an interesting little thing. And, and bear with me. Go with me to these places because we're going to go to all the accounts of this story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I just want you to see this um, because it's kind of neat. It's a little bit more. We're going to dig into this Bible study. I'm going to try to get this through this quickly. But it's important that you can see this for yourself and, and how you shouldn't let some things that might even seem to be an apparent contradiction. You look at that and be like, well, wait a minute, that, that just can't be right. We need to study the Bible as well, as ju besides just reading it. And when you see these things, really look it up. One good way to learn a lot of things is to compare the same stories in, the, in these other accounts, in these other books, and you can learn certain things that aren't in another one. You get the whole picture. But I'm going to help explain this to you and so you could see it for yourself. Turn if you would to Matthew 26. This is where we're going to start. And, and if, you, if you have anything, you might want to keep a bookmark into some of these places. Or, I mean, you could follow along and listen, but it's, it's good to see these things. And we're a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to read to you the same statement. Okay, the one in John 13 that we saw. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Okay, in Matthew 26... Verse 34, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And you don't have to turn there yet, but in Luke 22, um, the same story it says, Jesus says, and he said, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt de thrice deny that thou knowest me. So in three of the four accounts, it's saying that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And in one of them, it says you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. So how can this be? Now, I'm going to prove this to you a little bit later, but basically it's, it's really simple. First of all, I believe that Jesus made more than one statement to Peter about him denying him. And I'll prove that a little bit later why I believe that to be true. So that I don't think that, you know, one account is just wrong. That he didn't say twice. Or that he did say twice and it's just not recorded here. I don't believe that. I think he's, he's, he's telling Peter a couple times, look, you're going to deny me three times. And I think Peter is saying like, no, I won't. You know, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus says again, you know, look. Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he was like, no, I won't. And I, th you know, I think it kind of goes like that. because, And we'll see that. But, but it's, it, that's pretty simple. But the account in Mark 
tells us that the cock, the, that the, the rooster, the cock crows one time and then it crows again. Um, as Peter is denying Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at, at these accounts. And again, bear with me here. If you're in Matthew 26, we're going to jump down to verse 69. We're going to see Peter denying Jesus. And I, if I had a whiteboard or something, I'd write all this stuff down. I've got it in my notes, but it's kind of important to see this. Um, we're going to read through what how Peter denying Jesus. So in, in Matthew 26, verse 69... The Bible reads, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So in, in Matthew, the first time that Peter denies Christ, it says here he's without the, pass, the palace, and he's talking to a woman. He's talking to a damsel, right? A younger woman. Verse 71, it says, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. So the second time he's in the porch and a woman, a maid, again confronts him and, and, asks, and, and asks him about it. And he denies again. And it says in verse 73, And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. So, finally these people are saying, Look, you, you speak like, basically they're saying you speak like a Galilean. Jesus was of Galilee. They're saying you, you talk like him. You're, you know, your, your accent is giving you away. That you are, you are one of his disciples. And he denies again. <clears throat> And it says that that was um, after a while that happened. And they were able to tell by the way that he spake. Now in Mark, turn over to Mark if you would, just the next, the next book over, Matthew, Mark, Mark 14. We're going to see a similar course of events here that kind of line up almost exactly, I think, with Matthew 26. Mark 14, verse 66, the Bible reads, And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. So here we have a cock crowing at this point in the story. Now, again, in order for all this stuff to make sense, if Jesus said that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows, and in this story he only denies him one time, well, how can that be true? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, and this is what I don't want you to get shaken up about. because you know, I read this and I thought it was kind of strange. Like, How does this even all fit together? How can he say in all these other accounts, you're going to deny me three times before the cock even crows? But we see him here. This is only the first time he denies Jesus and, and the cock crows. We'll get to that in a minute. So it says, and, he, and a maid saw him again, in verse 69, and began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. Uh, and he denied it again. And, after, and a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Now, both instances in Matthew and Mark kind of line up with, with the events. The, the first time he, he denied Jesus in Mark, he was in the palace and he was warming himself and a, and a maid came up to him. The second time he was in the porch, which is exactly the same as the second time in Matthew, he was in the porch and a maid came to him. And then the third time, um, it was after a while, in both of them, after a little while here, and they talked about his, his speech and that's when he denied him. Let's look at Luke. Luke 22. Luke 22. 
Luke 22, and then we're going to go to John 18, because that's the last account. It's, it, this, uh, this story takes place in all, the, all four of the Gospels, so we can compare them all. Luke 22, verse, 25, or verse 55, excuse me, says, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him, and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him, and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. Now, in this one, the first one, he's in the midst of the hall, which may or not may not be in the palace in the same place as the first account and the other, the other accounts. And a, and a mate came up to him the first time. But in the second one, it says a little while later, a man um, talked to him because he said, Thou also art one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. So he's talking to a man. In the other two, the second time he denied Jesus, it was a maid that came unto him. This time it's a man. Now all of a sudden, we've got at least four times that he's denied Jesus. Right? Because... Let's say the first one here is the same as the first one in the other places. Well, the second one in the other places was a maid. But the second one here, he's talking to a man. And then the third one here, they're mentioning the fact that he's a Galilean, which we could probably reasonably assume it's because of the way he speaks, which the third time he, he did in the other accounts, they were both, they're always referring to the way he was talking. So to this point, we have at least four times that he's denied Jesus. Now let's turn to John 18, because this will kind of wrap it all up. John 18 and verse 15. Uh, verse 15 of John 18 says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, that disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So now we're back to the beginning of the story where Jesus is just being led in to the palace, right? John was with Jesus and he knows the high priest, so they let John in too. You know, they're bringing Jesus in to interrogate him. John comes in too. Verse 16 says, but because Peter was, was a far, farther way off, it says, but Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciple? disciples? He saith, I am not. So this is the true first time that Jesus or that Peter is denying Jesus because this is the, the woman that's at the gate of the palace where he's denying Jesus. In the other accounts, we don't see this. We see him already in the palace. And already, like in, in Mark, he was warming himself already. Well, he's right at the gate. He's not warming himself here. So this is yet another time that he denies Jesus. This is actually the first time that we get from the account here that he's warming or that he's, that he's let into the gate and this woman speaks unto him. So it's another woman that confronts him and says, Hey, aren't you? Aren't you? Like, oh, I don't know him. He denies. And then we keep reading here. It says, um, verse 18, And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So now we get to the point where he's warming himself. Jump down to verse 25. It says, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Now, he's not talking about his speech either, right? This is guy, he's saying, wait, I was there. 
You know, he's a kinsman. The, the guy, because when when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter takes out his sword and he's he's willing to fight at that point, and he he cuts off one of the guy's ears, and then Jesus heals him. That was this guy's relative, so he's paying close attention to Peter. He knows that he's seen him. He's like, wait a minute, weren't you with him in the garden, right? And of course, he denies that. But what I get from the story, look, this is at least six times that Peter has denied Jesus Christ. He didn't deny him only three times. Jesus just said that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. So when he tells him he's going to deny him three times before the cock crows, and then he tells him he's going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice, they're both true. Because by the time the cock crew the second time, he had already, you know, denied him a bunch of times, probably six times at least. And we don't know. You got to imagine, again, put yourself in the situation. You know, these are all of these different accounts of things that people are saying to him. But there's a group of people, you know, you know warming themselves. You could have multiple people say, wait a minute, no. You know, and, and this is what's happening. They're saying, you talk like a galleon. You weren't there? No, no, it wasn't me. You know, I saw you there. You weren't there? You know, no, no. A maid comes up. You, aren't you one of them? No. So he's denying and denying and denying and denying. But see, this doesn't pose a problem for Scripture. When you actually look at it really closely, I know, I hope I didn't bore you too much tonight with this, but it is important that we do these things because, I mean, you know, you're trusting in the Bible as the truth, and it is. And I don't want anyone to come to you and be like, oh, there's all these errors in the Bible, and see, look, it says this here, and he says this here. How could you even trust that? Because it says two different things. Well, first of all, and, okay, so I'll prove that to you. Why do I think that Jesus said that more than once? The reason why is back in John 13, um, uh, uh, um, here, back in Mark chapter 14. In Mark 14, the reason why I think that Jesus probably told Peter more than one time that he was going to deny him, right? Because I said that. I think that these accounts that we have are literally what Jesus said. I trust the Bible. I trust that that's true. I trust that Jesus said these things. I don't think there's a mistake that, that, that you know, John forgot to write down that he said, oh, before the cock crows twice. No, I don't think he forgot that at all. I think he was just recording one of the statements that Jesus made, but Jesus made more than one statement about him denying him. And the reason why, one of the reasons why I think that is in Mark 14, uh, in verse 29, the Bible says, But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. So he's arguing back and forth because he says he spake the more vehemently. So he's even more saying like, no, I am, I am going to, you know, die for you. Which would lead me to believe, why wouldn't Jesus answer him again and say, no, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three, you know, three times. And... Um, it just makes sense if you think about the conversation that they're having. If you kind of put yourself into what's going on here, and and what you know, if you were a part of that group, and, and what what would you imagine going on, and you could see all these recorded statements. Of course, it only makes sense that that you know, Jesus, or Peter's affirming multiple times that he's not going to deny him, and Jesus is responding and saying, "Yeah, you will." And the same thing when there's a group of people all starting to confront Peter and say, wait a minute, you're one of them, weren't you? He say, no, you're one of you know, Nope, wasn't me. And he, and he does this over um, a long span. And we saw the two, in a, you know, I didn't draw much attention to it, but in one of the accounts it says that an hour had passed um, before the third um, denial. And that was in Luke, I think. And in other ones it says a while had passed. So there's, there's a lot of time for people to be to be asking him this and, um, and for him to be denying. But I think by the time the cock crew the first time, he had already denied him three times. It's very reasonable to believe that. And we have all these times we saw at the gate. You know, again, it's another reason why it's important to look at all the Gospels, look at the story from all accounts, because you don't know about him denying very right away from the gate until you get to John. None of the other ones even record that. 
And the same thing with the guy that the, the, the kinsman of the, the guy who was Erie cut off. We don't know about that one either. Those are just two more times that he denies Jesus. So unfortunately, Peter denied Jesus even more than three times. He denied him, we counted at least six times. And maybe more because we don't know for sure that some of these other accounts are the exact same person. We don't know that. You can't say that with undoubtedly that, that some of these people that confront him, it just says a maid or a damsel. We don't know if it's the same maid or damsel in the other accounts. But um, anyway, so don't, you know, this is one of those examples that people will try to turn to. And I'll tell you what, I, I don't mind looking at them. I actually like looking at them when people try to try to claim that you're atheists or people, oh, I used to be Christian, but then I see all these errors and stuff and, and I don't believe in God's word. Without fail, I'm not saying I've always understood everything right away, but without fail, any time someone tries to bring up a contradict, a so-called contradiction in the Bible, there is always a good reason for it, and it's not really a contradiction. You just have to look at it and study it and understand what is really happening here. And this isn't that difficult to go through and understand. It really isn't. You just have to take the time to do it and make sure you're reading very carefully and thinking, how can this actually work? And we're not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to make it work. It's just taking notice of the right things of saying, oh, he obviously, and it's very provable, denied Jesus more than three times. So, you know, it, 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 it totally satisfies my questioning completely that, that there's no errors and no contradiction in these chapters. But, um, you know, don't let people get, get you twisted up on that. And um, if that ever comes up and you don't have an answer for it, study it out for yourself and, and pray for God to, to open it up for you. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for the book. Dear God, I pray that you would please help us to be um, sound in our faith and trust you completely, dear Lord. Um, I thank you. Your book is so amazing. The Bible is so amazing, dear Lord. Um, everything fits together perfectly, kind of like a puzzle that... that um, has a billion pieces, Lord. There's so much to, um, to find and so many truths to find in your word. And it's amazingly perfect, dear Lord, as you are. And we thank you so much for loving us and giving us your words whereby we might be saved. God, I pray that you would please help us to have a proper spirit inside of us as a minister, as someone who wants to help others out the same way that Jesus did, dear Lord. Help us to look and use Jesus as our example in our lives, dear God. And we love you and we thank you so much for the love you've extended to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.